Well, you remember Abraham and Sarah had a child in their old age. That's where Israel began. Israel, the nation, began as a miracle. Had a child in their old age, named him Isaac. Isaac married a woman named Rebekah, and the Bible says Rebekah was barren, but God miraculously allowed them to have children, and they had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. For the record, Esau came out first, and then Jacob, and so technically Esau was the older of the two twins, but the Lord said to the parents, the, young, the older will serve the younger. And the blessing of, of uh, God's promised people will come upon the younger of the two, which would be Jacob. And so Esau knew this, and Jacob and Esau's mother knew this, but they thought that they needed to help God out, even though God had prophesied it. And so they tricked Esau. Actually, they tricked Esau's daddy uh, into thinking that he was pronouncing a blessing upon Esau when he was actually pronouncing it upon Jacob. But God had prophesied that Esau was going to serve Jacob and that the blessings of the nation were going to come on Jacob. But anyway, they did that anyway, made Esau mad. The Bible says Esau wanted to kill his brother Jacob. So Jacob ran away and met up with Esau in the years later and... He was afraid that Esau was going to kill him, but instead they embraced each other and kind of made up and stuff. But the hatred, the resentment of the fact that, hey, I'm the firstborn, uh, the blessing of God ought to be on me, the inheritance of the promised land ought to be my inheritance. Jacob, I mean, Esau kept that, okay? I'm going somewhere with this, all right? So please don't lose me. There was a resentment on the part of Esau toward his brother Jacob, and that was passed on to the next generations. Now, Esau, who hated Jacob, had a grandson. And the grandson's name was Amalek. And from Amalek came the Amalekites, or the Amalekites. <laughs> it's literally the way it ought to be, but we've called them Amalekites for so long, I don't want to try to change that. God said... He was going to obliterate and wipe off of the face of the earth the Amalekites, the descendants of Amalek, who was a grandson of Esau, who hated the Israelites. Remember, Jacob, the one who was given the promise, his name was changed to Israel, and that's where the Israelites come from. They come from Jacob. And so descendants of Esau, Esau had the nickname Edom. So anytime you read about the nation Edom, they're descendants of Esau. But so were the Amalekites, the descendants of Esau's grandson Amalek. Why in the world would God want to wipe the descendants of Amalek off the face of the earth and obliterate them? I mean, you know, I understand Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, he wiped out two cities because of the... The wickedness of those cities. And by the way, the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy says there's two other cities, uh, Adma and Zeboim, that were also wiped out. I just thought I'd mention that just for your information. But, you know, I understand that, but an entire nation of people. Now, before we go any further, I made a mistake in my thinking, and maybe you've made that mistake too. And, and if you haven't, then hey, you beat me on this. But I used to think that the Amalekites were in that list of the different ites that were in the land of Canaan that were going to be uh, run out or destroyed, you know, like the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Hivites and, and the Mosquito Bites and all those guys, you know. But they're not. They are not in that list of people. The Amalekites weren't in the land of Canaan. The Amalekites were nomads. They would go wherever the food was wherever the game was, wherever there was somebody that they could pillage. They were nomads. They weren't in the land of Canaan. <clears throat> and so I, 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 I want to go to the passage, but then I want to quickly go to another passage after that, but I want you to you know, keep that old packet, the other passage marked, maybe just keep it on the screen, but... Um, Chapter 17, starting with verse 8. Amalek. 
the Amalekites, came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Remember, that's where the water came from the rock. They still haven't moved. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur, of course Aaron was Moses' brother and Hur was a son of, uh, oh good grief, Caleb. They went to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Why? Well, we'll get to that. But Moses' hands were heavy, you can imagine. Then they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, because Joshua was going to be next after Moses died, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Well, there were other descendants of Esau. Why Amalek picked out for total destruction? Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 through 19, I have it down right here. So I'm going to read it instead of having you turn to it. Moses is speaking to them. He's about to die. And then Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. He's reminding them of a lot of the things that were commanded. And he's also reminding them of their history. And listen to what he says about Amalek. Remember what Amalek, this is of course the nation, did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. How he met you along the way and attacked among you all the strugglers at your rear when you were faint and weary. And he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. Okay? Way back in Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abraham to go sojourn in the land that his descendants were going to possess, he said, I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. Have you noticed all of the nations that want to curse Israel? All of the nations who don't want Israel to have the right to exist? And do you hear what the extremists from those nations say? They say death to Israel. And then what else do they say? Death to the United States. What did we do? We're friends of Israel. I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you, I will curse. One of the most foolish things that our country could ever do would be to quit being friends with Israel. The Bible promises blessings to those who bless Israel and curses to those who curse Israel. Well, now what has happened? Here's this hatred that has gone from generation to generation to generation of Israel. And you've got the Israelites traveling out of Egypt to the promised land, they're going out in the wilderness. And what does it say? The Amalekites were coming up to the people that were the stragglers. Could you let your mind go there for a while? What kind of stragglers do you think you would have? People with bad limbs, crippled people, people very, very old, uh, pregnant women, women with a whole bunch of preschoolers. And toddlers attacking them. Now let your mind go to what kind of attacking we're thinking about. Any kind of anything that you could think about when somebody attacks somebody else, that was what was taking place. Robbery, murder, rape, name it. 
So here you have a nation of people and you've got the most helpless people of that nation bringing up the rear, doing their best to keep up. And you've got a nation of people attacking them and robbing them and raping them and killing them. And what kind of people are they? They are God's chosen nation where God said, whoever attacks you attacks the apple of my eye. And in another passage, he said, a woman might forget her nursing child if that were possible, but I'll never forget you. And God promised in his word that the nation of Israel was going to reign in Jerusalem and the Messiah was going to reign with Israel in Jerusalem. That is a promise that's unconditional. It's going to take place. If this world was going to blow up and there only be two people left, it's going to be two Israelites. Because God promised. When God makes a prophecy, nothing can stop his prophecy. You can't stop God. And when God says he's going to do something, he can't be providentially hindered. He's providence. So you can't stop God. And so God says, I have chosen Jacob. I have changed his name to Israel. I am going to bless that nation. Now, there have been some cases where... God judged Israel because of what? They have the responsibility to the rest of the world to show that he's God. And they are supposed to receive the word of God, Romans chapter 3 verse 2, to give to the rest of the world. And then they start worshiping the stars of heaven and start worshiping the moon and start worshiping goddesses and start worshiping statues and stuff. God says, you're messing up my message for the whole world. You have a responsibility. And so he would judge them. The northern ten tribes, the Assyrians, wiped them out, took them captive. They became the Samaritans. The southern two tribes, they were a little bit farther along before they started turning their backs on God. And the Babylonians took them and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple and took them captive to Babylon. But every time God said, this is in Deuteronomy, Moses warned them, God will judge you if you start worshiping idols and start acting the way that God doesn't want you to act. You have a responsibility to the rest of the world. He's going to judge you. But listen to this. Then he's going to judge that nation that he used to judge you. Babylon, the great Babylonian empire. What's Babylon now? Iraq. How'd you like to live there? Yeah. Empires come and go. God sets one up and puts another one down. So you don't want to be the nation that God uses to judge Israel. Because any excesses on the part of that nation, they get judged by God. So here you have the Amalekites picking on the helpless people of Israel. And God says, they're not going to exist anymore. And I want you to see to it. All right. So you got it. That's why war with Amalek from generation to generation. And then later on, they are in the promised land. And they rebel against God and they say, give us a king. And, you know, Samuel says, man, you don't want a king. And they say, oh, give us a king. And God says, come on, they're rebelling actually against me. Go ahead and give them a king like they ask. And they get King Saul. And God says through the prophet Samuel, now it's time, Saul. Wipe the Amalekites off the face of the earth. Now, in this particular passage, they won a battle against an Amalekite army. By the way, what kind of weapons do you think the Israelites had? They'd been slaves in Egypt, you know. I took, I took a shovel to them, you know. I mean, they didn't have elaborate weapons, but God saw to it that they won. But Saul, now it's time to go wipe the Amalekites out. All of the people, all of the animals. Saul saves the fattest sheep and saves the Amalekite king Agag. Yeah. Brings him back and Saul says, I've done the will of God. Samuel says, I hear bleeding sheep. Hmm. Oh, but those are to sacrifice to the Lord. That's not what the Lord said. And who's this? Oh, that's the king. Uh, we, we saved him. Well, you were supposed to kill him. And so the Bible says Samuel killed him. The king's name was Agag. Any of you all familiar with the book of Esther? And wicked Haman. Haman who wanted to 
wipe out all the Israelites? By the, you can't do that. That's what he wanted to do. Guess what? You can trace wicked Haman back to King Agag and Amalekite. Haman and Amalekite, who hadn't quite been wiped out yet, wanted to wipe out Israel. That hatred goes on and on and on. By the way, what happened to wicked Haman? You don't go after Israel. He died on the very gallows that he set up to, to kill somebody else on. All right, so having said that, there's some strange stuff about this passage. But once again, like we talked about last week, God doesn't do ritual just because he likes ritual. God doesn't say do this a certain way and do that a certain way because he likes to play these little games with us. There's meaning behind it. Okay, and now Moses had this staff. And remember with the call of Moses, we started using the staff. And when Moses went to the elders of Israel, he would use that to perform miracles. He would, and, he, and then later with the plagues, he would strike the Nile or he'd raise it up to heaven and flies or gnats would come and things along that line. So God was doing something with this staff and with Moses. So... We have this battle, and we have Moses on the top of a hill, holding his hands up in the air. And one of the hand, in one of the hands, he has the staff that he's been using time and time again. And while he's holding the staff up in the air, the Israelites are defeating the Amalekites. And when his arms get tired, and he puts the staff down, the Amalekites start winning. So, oh man, holds it back up. And so finally, Aaron and Hur put a rock down, and he sits on the rock, and then they hold his arms up so that he can hold the staff up. What in the world? Why didn't God just say, there they are, go after them, and I'll whip them for you? You know, I mean, he was clearly showing that he was going to fight their battles for them. I mean, let's put this with everything else that's happened. He's given them the water that they've needed. He protected them from an army that was attacking them, led them across the sea on dry land. He gave them the food that they needed. So protection from enemies, food, water, leadership with the cloud and with the fire. Now, I'm going to fight your battles for you. You go to war with somebody, I'm going to uphold you. So they were learning that. But why this? What had happened just before that? They're at the same place, Rephidim. And they said, for the fourth time, you've brought us out here in the wilderness to die. And water comes out of the rock and they drink out of the rock. What did Moses say that they were about to do? What am I going to do with these people, Lord? They're about to stone me. God needed to uphold Moses. God was establishing the leadership of Moses before these people. You have this battle that you have to fight. And I want you to understand, this man that I have placed over you, this Moses, I am upholding him. He is the one that I have called. And you do not challenge his leadership. Do you remember the call of Moses? He didn't even want to go, did he? Man, you know, choose somebody else. I mean, I'm not I'm worthy to do this, you know. But God called him. Okay? Then what did God do? With the call came special gifts from God to do miraculous things to confirm that Moses was indeed God's chosen leader. And then God spoke through Moses. Please listen to this. The first five books of the Bible to the Jews were called the law, the Pentateuch, the five writings. But they also sometimes just called them Moses. First five books of the Bible, Moses. You see, God spoke to Moses, it says in God's word, face to face. He would speak to them through Acts and he would speak to them through Moses. But he spoke to Moses face to face. And in another place, God said, you know, I speak to you through messages and through prophets, but 
I speak to Moses face to face. What do you think you're doing opposing Moses? Book of Numbers, again, there's this group that opposed him and they wanted to be priests, although they weren't appointed to do that, and God killed them. Is it really all that important? Well, let's see. You know, I'm reading the Word of God here in Exodus. And what I have here in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Genesis is the Word of God given to Moses for me. It's called Moses by the Jews. Sometimes the law, sometimes they just call it Moses. In the same way, he backed up what he did with signs and wonders. Okay, Moses, you're going to try to stone Moses? Let me show you something. As long as Moses is holding his hands up, you're going to win. And when Moses puts his hands down, you're going to lose. You were going to stone this man? You need to listen to this man. So you have all of the signs and the wonders that God did through Moses so that when Moses said, thus says the Lord, it was like God backed him up. Once again, this is not one man telling us what the truth is. But this is God giving his truth to an entire nation. He spoke through Moses, but he backed it up with signs and wonders. New Testament, Hebrews chapter 2, says, How can we neglect so great a salvation, which was first given to us by the Lord, and then God spoke through signs and wonders and backed up what he said? Now, that's Coker paraphrase. But in the New Testament, what did you have? You had apostles who were eyewitnesses to everything that Jesus did and said, Hey, that's pretty good. But then the Bible also says that there were signs and wonders done by the apostles. Acts chapter 2. You go on later in the book of Acts and it says that sometimes the shadow of Peter would pass over somebody and they would be healed. Well, I don't see stuff like that. I don't see oceans parted and people walking across on dry land. and I don't see the shadow of somebody passing by and somebody gets healed by it. I don't see like some apostle getting bit by a snake and then not swelling up and dying, but instead he prospers. You know, what's the point here? Well, yeah, I don't see that because this is complete. You see, the, the reason that God did these miraculous things through Moses and these miraculous things through the first century apostles is to give us this. He would speak and then back it up with signs. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, the signs of an apostle have been done among you. In other words, hey, I'm an apostle. I'm called to be an apostle just like Moses was called to be Moses. I was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And God backed me up with the signs of an apostle. Remember, he preached too long and this guy fell out of a second story window and fell down dead. And the Apostle Paul stretched himself out on him and he came back to life. Do that today. Well, you don't see that today because we don't need the signs to back this book up. This book is complete now. Does God still do miracles? Yes, he does. Does God miraculously answer prayers? Yes, he does. Does God do signs? He doesn't have to. He's done. Revelation chapter 22, what does it say? Don't add to this. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. Whoa. That's why I've got a big beef with the Book of Mormon. Taking this and adding to it. You don't do that. Because God's done. And that's why you're not seeing those things. You're, you're seeing answers to prayer. You're seeing miraculous protection and healing and things like that. But... Signs of an apostle and signs by Moses, we're not seeing that because we don't have to. So, once again, God speaks and God backs it up with miracles, public miracles. Who experienced the battle against the Amalekites? All of Israel. Who was it that saw Moses on top of the hill and understood that when his hand was uplifted with his staff, they prevailed, and when he was hand, his hand was down, they did not? 
So it shows God's provision for winning the battle, and it shows Moses' position as God's chosen vessel to give the word of God to the Israelites to give to us. Well, okay. Isn't that great? Now let's all go home and say, wow, we understand now why the Amalekites needed to be wiped out, and we understand maybe we've got John's take on why Moses held his staff up. Well, that's not going to do you and me any good. There ought to be some kind of an application in this for us. Are we in a war? You know, as soon as you get saved, you're in a war. As soon as you get saved, you have an enemy. And your enemy wants to render you ineffective. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not a a war against flesh and blood. God's Word makes it very plain. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So the enemy is not people. I, oh, I need to keep getting that in my head. The enemy is not people. The enemy is principalities and powers that influence people. And people are the ones that we're trying to rescue from the hands of the enemy. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. If our gospel is veiled... It's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God, little g, of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, before I got saved, I was blinded to my sinfulness and my need for Jesus. And God Almighty opened up my eyes to see my sinfulness and my need for Jesus Christ. I didn't get argued into that by a person. Okay? My, my mind was blinded. And so was yours, believer in Jesus. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, and ask yourself if we're in a war. The weapons of our warfare, hmm. <laughs> uh, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Here's the picture. You got people whose minds are blinded and they are captive. It says in 2 Timothy, captive by the devil to do his will. And by the way, if you don't believe in the existence of a devil, guess what? You're a captive. Thought I might mention that. And Paul says, here's the picture. They're blinded and they're captive and they're inside his fortress. They're his prisoners. And we have weapons that are mighty through God to go to that fortress and tear down the walls. And to take those people who are captive to him and take them out of his camp and bring them into God's camp. That's the picture that takes place. There are principalities and powers that blind minds and cause people to have all kinds of weird speculations about what's true and what isn't and wild ideas about God. And you have the one true God that has said, I have spoken, I've spoken publicly, I've backed it up with signs and wonders. This is the word of God. And you have the people with the speculations go, well, that's just a bunch of uh, stories and myths and made up stuff and, you know. It's just speculation. It's blinded minds. I remember a guy named Junior lived in Kroll, Texas. Okay? And uh, Junior, you know, he would sit in Sunday school class and he said, you know, yeah, I'm a member of First Baptist of Kroll, and, and, uh, but I don't believe in hell. And his Sunday school teacher said, Junior, the Bible says there's a hell. Well, I just don't believe that a loving God could ever send anybody to hell. Well, you know, Jesus died so that nobody would have to go to hell, you know, Junior. But the Bible says there's a hell. Well, there's parts of the Bible that just really don't belong. And so there's certain parts of the Bible I believe and certain parts that I don't believe, you know. Junior got real, real sick and thought he was going to die. And he said he had a dream. And in the dream, the devil was chasing him. And Jesus rescued him. He said, I woke up from the dream and I said, I don't think I'm saved. He called out to the Lord. He said, Lord, 
if, if you didn't save me before, would you save me now? And Junior came to me after he'd gotten over his illness and he said, I need to be baptized. I've been saved now. And he said, by the way, there is a hell. What happened? He got genuinely converted. Understand when you get saved, you get converted. You don't go from believing nothing to believing something. You go from believing one thing to believing another. You go from believing wrongly to believing rightly. And in this particular case, there's a battle going on for the hearts and minds of people. And the scripture says that believers are soldiers in God's army. We don't fight people. We fight for people. We want people to be taken out of Satan's camp as his prisoners and put in the family of God. That's what our battle is all about. And so you understand that the adversary does not want you to win. So he's going to tempt you. He's going to try to confuse you. He's going to try to intimidate you. Whatever it takes, whatever buttons need to be punched, those are the buttons that he's going to punch because there is a war going on. Now, what really gets me is how many people who claim to be Christians that do not acknowledge at all that there's any kind of battle going on. It's like, well, I'm saved. <laughs> Ain't that great? You know, nah, responsibility, I don't you know. Uh, you know, I'm just happy to be saved, but I, I don't really have to do anything. The Bible says that you have the responsibility of fulfilling the Great Commission. The Great Commission goes from generation to generation. Teaching them to observe all things, big A, L, L, all things that I've commanded you. And so, in other words, the first group of Christians are supposed to teach the next group of Christians to do everything that they've done. And then that group teaches everything to the next group. So that's got to include the Great Commission. So you have a responsibility. And guess what? If you're not doing anything about it, you're on the sidelines and you're not fighting the battle. And Satan is happy. He doesn't have to worry about you. Maybe it's because you're intimidated. Maybe it's because you're all cut up in making a living or you're all cut up in being popular or you, know, or you're, or you're all cut up with some kind of fun thing that you're doing or, or you're obsessed with some kind of sinful behavior. What, you know, whatever it is, whatever it takes, you're on the sidelines. And you're not winning the battle. Well, there's a threshold that a nation can cross, apparently, where God says the only good thing for the rest of the world is that you get wiped out. Has our country reached that threshold? I don't think so. I don't think so. I have observed, though. I go from when I was a kid to when I had kids when my kids had kids and I see a pattern each generation gets a little more lawless a little more wicked a little more perverse a little less respectful toward authority I see a trend in the United States of America that's very alarming I see America headed toward that threshold I don't believe she's there yet because I'm reminded that God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah if he'd simply found 10 righteous people. I believe there's a percentage of righteous people in the United States of America that are praying. I believe there are at least a million people in this country that are praying for a great awakening in our country. I believe there are more than 10 in this very room that are praying for that. So it's not like you're following all kinds of perverse things and, and you have no respect for authority and you don't believe the Bible. You know, you, you do and you do respect authority and you do want to be pleasing to God and you are praying for a great awakening. So now I don't think our country is there. I think our country is going that direction. I think a great awakening would rescue our country. But here's the point this morning. People are headed to that threshold. Individual people are headed to the point where God says, you know what? 
your heart is so hard, you're not savable anymore. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 3, Beware, brethren, lest there dwell in you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. The Bible says don't harden your heart so that you become uh, deceived by sin. So there comes a point where a person just hardens his heart so much toward God that he's not reachable. God tugs at, a, tugs at a person's heartstrings, draws him to Jesus Christ, and he, he usually doesn't say no, he just says later, or I'll think about it. I remember an old man named Lewis. I mean, Lewis was nearly 90, and here's what he said, oh, I'm going to live to be 100, and then I'll think about being saved. <laughs> well, he didn't live to be 100, and he didn't get saved. Okay? I remember a kid, nine years old, one time a revival meeting. After, after the meeting was over with, he came up to me and he said, you going to do that saved thing tomorrow? I said, yeah, we do that saved thing every, every revival meeting. Good. I'm thinking about getting saved tomorrow. I said, if you're thinking about it, you need to do it now. If God's calling you right now, you need to do something. No, I'm, I'll do it tomorrow. He didn't show up the next day. He didn't show up at all after that. I was there another, another six years. And he never darkened the door of the church again. I moved away from there and he had not accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Still here. Distraction. You know, so the point is people, individuals can reach that point of no return in their lives. Uh, my friend Gary Tatum visited with a guy, the Union City, visited with this guy, and he said, I shared the gospel with him, and he said, man, he was crying. He said, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Well, I'll, I'll be praying for you to be able to do, to do that, to give your life to Jesus. Okay, you know. So Gary said, John, let's you and me go visit that guy. And we went to visit him, and you know what he did? He watched TV. It was like, well, they're here, but not, this is my program, you know. Like, yeah, what'd you say? Okay. No effect whatsoever. What's happening? The heart is getting hardened. And, and that, you know, so there's where the battle is. There, not necessarily the whole country is going to get wiped from the face of the earth, but there are people who are getting harder and harder and harder to reach. And there's a point of no return. And so warfare is so important for you and me. Okay, well then, once again, 2 Corinthians, I love 10-4. I didn't grow up in the CB days, but 10-4, good buddy. That's how I remember 2 Corinthians 10-4. Sorry about that. but The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. What are we talking about? Well, as far as warfare goes, Ephesians chapter 6, it says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the Bible also speaks about the prayer of a righteous person avails much. So the Word of God and prayer. Learn the truth, speak the truth, pray. Pray. the three open prayer that the Billy Graham Association mentions is something that you and I need to constantly remember and we need to practice it. Pray for an open door. Your neighbor, your work associate, somebody you go to school with, relative, they're in your circle of influence. Maybe they're really, really close. Maybe they're out there a little ways, but pray for an open door. Pray for an open heart. They're thinking one way. They're, they're imprisoned by speculations. Pray for God to open their heart to the truth. And then pray for an open mouth. You know, you can do all kinds of good things, and then when it comes time to share your belief about the Lord Jesus Christ, you can balk. You can balk at that. Even the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 said, Pray for me that God will give me boldness. Acts chapter 4, first century church, the apostles threatened, the church got together and they said, God grant us boldness. Yeah. You can do all kinds of nice things in the church. And we do a lot of nice things here at First Baptist Pawnee. 
But we must not stop short of sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with other people when there's an open door. Open door, open heart, open mouth. Just like Junior who had this closed door. He came to church. He came to Sunday school. He believed the wrong things. He didn't believe the word of God. His wife and his Sunday school teacher and his pastor were praying for God to open his heart to the truth. It took a pretty serious thing, but it worked. God opened his heart. And Junior became a Christian. So consequently, you're not going to argue somebody into the kingdom of God. Share what you believe, share what the Bible says, but when it comes to having that heart open to receive the truth of God's Word, it takes a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? God's not tired. God doesn't have just a certain number of miracles that He can do. God can do more, it says in His Word, than we can ask or even think. According to the power of that, works in us. Whoa. The spirit of the God who created everything out of nothing. The spirit of the God who raised Jesus from the dead. The the spirit of the God who's going to fix our lights. The spirit of the God who parted the Red Sea lives in you and me. And when we pray for God to open the heart of somebody... It can be the most wicked person that you've ever met in your life. And God can melt that heart and transform that life. Sorry, but I've lived a long time and I've pastored for 41 years. And my first pastor, there was a guy who didn't even call me the preacher. He had a dirty word that he called me. That's what I was called, you know. And God led us to go visit him. This same Gary, you know, that we visited, the guy that just watched TV. Oh, Gary, I believe the Lord wants us to go visit Cliff. Cliff? Yeah, Cliff. You know, Cliff had a whole bunch of rent houses and he didn't take care of them and yet he demanded the rent from people, you know. And Cliff was one of the most foul-mouthed people that you would want to meet. And he did a lot of dishonest stuff. Yeah, go visit Cliff. What we didn't know is that Cliff had been sick and had almost died and he was scared to death that he was going to die and go to hell. We had no idea. All we knew was that the Spirit of God impressed us to go visit Cliff. Yeah? What do you want? Uh, Cliff, uh, Gary and I want to talk to you about God. Well, come on in. Come on in. Wait a minute. Didn't you call me? Yeah, I called you that. Okay, well, come on in. Come in, sit down. Cliff, have you come to the point in your life that if you died, you'd know you'd go to heaven? Here's what Cliff said. I'd go to hell. I need to know what I need, I need to do about my sins. Do you think God opened his heart? Cliff became my channel catfishing buddy. Cliff raised green peppers and tomatoes for Falls Creek every year. Cliff loved the Lord and witnessed to the rest of his family. But I guarantee you, now I'm, oh boy, that sounds like I'm a judge, but I think before his conversion, I think he was the meanest man in Union City. God transformed his life. Hmm. Sort of like the man that was on his way to Damascus to have Christians arrested and some of them put to death became the Apostle Paul. All right, here we go. Moses was called. Paul was called to be an apostle. With the call came the backing of God, the signs and the wonders and the miracles to confirm it. And there's more to this passage, but the Lord said, shut up. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Some of y'all were going, yeah, Yeah, he did. He he told me that quite a while ago. But anyway, all right. So I'm going to ask the band to come, get ready. And going to ask you to meditate. 
based upon what you've heard. And then also, do you think that maybe Moses holding his hands up was a sign of his dependence upon God? Moses depending on God, them depending on God with Moses as their leader. That's not a far-fetched notion. I believe there's a lot to that. This might very well be a sign of praying to God for victory. All done. God bless you.